Hello, everybody. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited to do this today. This is, uh, I've done a number of these talks, and this crowd is, is actually, I think, extremely applicable to, to what we do with Hit Record. Um, and, uh, and in fact, sort of the, the open source and freeware movement is, in many ways, a loose inspiration for how we make art on Hit Record. So I'm really, really interested to talk to you guys. Um, and see what you think of some of these ideas, uh, because I think you'll probably have spent more time thinking about these kinds of things than most crowds that I talk to about this kind of stuff. So um, thanks for being here. I'm, I'm excited to do this. Um, and thanks to the Linux Foundation for the opportunity. Um, all right, so when I was six years old, uh, I started working as an actor. I looked like that. Uh, and uh, I was working in TV and movies and stuff, and I loved it. Um, I always really loved it, even at that age. Um, and and I, I feel lucky that I got to keep doing it throughout adolescence. I was working in stuff. And uh, then when I was 19, I quit so that I could go to college. Um, and I did that for about 20 minutes. And then uh, when I wanted to get back into acting, uh, I couldn't get a job. No one would give me a part. And this was actually really painful. Because I wanted to be creative, but I couldn't be. And, and at that point, I realized that I needed to take responsibility for my own creative outlet. I couldn't wait around for someone to give me a job. I, I had to be able to express myself and make things of my own volition. And, uh, and I even came up with, with a, little, uh, a little phrase to sort of encapsulate this idea. And uh, that phrase was, hit record. Because I always had a thing for like the, the red circle record button on the video camera. And, uh, and it became a sort of symbol to me to push that button to hit record meant to, you know, to get started and buckle down and, and do it and make something. Um, so I did. I, I started, uh, you know, writing stories and making little videos and recording songs. And, um, and then when I wanted to share some of this stuff with the world, my brother helped me set up this tiny little website and we called it hitrecord.org. Okay, so now this is where this work is interesting. As people started coming to this website, which at this point was it was just a little like uh, you know one of those PHP prefab message boards, um, but even at that small scale, what we noticed was um, there were some people who came just to check out the stuff that I had done, and then there were some people who wanted to just post the stuff that they had done, but then there were some people whose natural tendency was to make things together, both with me and with each other. And, and my brother and I thought, now, that's, that's cool. That's something that like, wouldn't have been possible any other time in history before the internet. And, and this is what I want to talk about today, right? Is how people can form a community online to be creative together. You guys know a lot about this if you're writing code together. Um, but in, in my world of sort of art, whether it's making videos or music or creative writing, et cetera, um, most creativity that happens online isn't, isn't like that. Um, because a lot of what happens online when it comes to creativity is sort of people sharing things that they've made on their own. But what I'm talking about is people making things together that they couldn't have made on their own. So that was 10 years ago that, that we set up that little PHP message board. And um, since then, the Hit Record community has it's grown quite a lot, and we've done some really cool things. Uh, if I do say so myself, you know, we've we've screened our short films at film festivals, and we've published books, and we've put out records, and we put on live events uh, in venues all around the world, and um, we made a television show that won an Emmy. And um, whenever one of these productions turned a profit, we paid our contributing artists fairly. And so over the years, I feel like I've learned some things about what it takes for an online community to be creative together. And so today, what I want to do is talk about some of the things that we've learned. And here's the thing. I love the internet. We all love the internet. Obviously, the internet is you know, an incredibly positive thing for the world in many, many ways. But I do think there are some things about today's online culture that limit our abilities to come together and be creative. And again, I think it's important to distinguish today that when I say online culture, I'm not talking about the online culture on GitHub. I'm talking about the online culture like, you know, on, say, YouTube or, you know, more, I guess, uh, general culture on the internet. Um, so 
I want to bring up three sort of things that happen on the internet a lot. I'm going to call them sort of like pillars of today's internet. Um, and uh, they are the crowd, free culture, and socializing. All right, so let me dive into each of these. First of all, the crowd. Okay, so obviously we've all heard of crowdsourcing. We've all heard about the power of the crowd. Um, I'll bring up two main kinds of crowdsourcing happening today. Um, first kind I'd call big data-driven crowdsourcing, right? So this is where a huge number of people provide their data without it costing them any effort, sometimes without them even realizing that it's happening. Uh, and then a computer program is able to take all that data and do something useful with it, right? So like Waze, for example, that amalgamates massive amount of user-generated data to provide traffic information. Okay, so that's one kind of crowdsourcing. Uh, and, and this kind of crowdsourcing, it can be very useful for sort of high volume technical tasks like providing traffic information. But it's not really good at anything creative. All right, the second kind of crowdsourcing is what I would call uh, an open contest. Um, and so this is where there's a task that needs doing and anyone can submit their attempt at achieving that task and then someone picks a winner and then the winner gets some kind of reward. Um, one example of this is the company XPRIZE. And they've accomplished some terrific things, definitely creative things, like they created a reusable suborbital spaceship, or they were you know, working on innovative solutions to cleaning up oil spills and things like that. So, and they do this by offering big cash prizes to the winners of their competitions. And it's, it's wonderful that they're getting stuff like this done. Um, now, Obviously, contests like this, they've been around for ages, right? And using the internet to run a contest like this, that's a step in the right direction because a greater number of people get to contribute. But the limitation is that all those people, they're not really working together. In fact, they're working against each other. So if one person over here has a good idea, that doesn't help this person over here, right? In fact, it, it harms this other person because it hurts their chances of winning the contest. So what this doesn't take advantage of is what would happen if all these people could put their heads together in an organized way? And could they accomplish something greater than they could on their own? I think they could, and you guys know that they can because, again, the open source software movement is really the best example of that ever happening. Um, so that's um, what I would call the crowd. Um, next pillar of the internet I want to talk about is, is free culture. This is something I'm sure all of you guys think about a lot. Uh, it's a given now, right? All of the world's culture, art, literature, science, journalism, etc., it's all available for free online, which is obviously awesome. And the biggest example of this is, of course, Google. Anything we want to know or see or hear, you know, we can just Google it, and there it is right away for free. But, again, I do think that this kind of free culture, it puts some limits on our ability to be creative together online. And now I acknowledge that the laws surrounding intellectual property uh, and copyright in this country are antiquated. I think they are, and they probably need reform. And in fact, the phrase that I'm using for this section of, of the talk, uh, free culture, that's the title of a book Maybe you, some of you guys have read by a great legal thinker called Lawrence Lessig, who's very critical of today's copyright laws, and, and I agree with him. However, I also firmly believe in a basic principle that if someone does some work and creates some kind of intellectual property, and then that intellectual property is able to generate any kind of revenue, then that creator deserves some of that money. Seems like common sense to me. I know not all of the licenses in, in the open source movement work that way. I think some do and some don't. Um, that's my personal take on it is, again, if, if, if someone does some work and that work generates money, I think the person who did the work deserves some of that money. Um, unfortunately, this is often not what's happening online today in the context of free culture. And, and, and I'm, again, I'm not really talking about uh, the open source software movement, I'm talking about free culture, like all that journalism and art and literature and stuff that you get for free online 
when you Google something. Because um, there's, there's another book about this kind of thing, which I don't know if you guys have read, but this is, to me, a really interesting book you might like. Uh, it's called Who Owns the Future by Jaron Lanier. Um, and what Mr. Lanier says is, all that stuff that you Google and that Google is sort of serving you up for free, well, it's not really free. Because there's money being generated in that transaction, because at the same time as it serves you the free content, it's also serving you advertisements, right? The problem is that none of that ad money is going to the creator of the content that's being served. All that money is just going to Google. Now, this business model has pretty much decimated the music industry. Granted, the music industry sort of had it coming in a lot of ways, but the truth is, it's a lot harder nowadays to earn an honest living as a musician than it used to be. Same thing's happening uh, in the field of journalism, right? Especially more long-form investigative journalism. As local and regional news organizations all over the world are, are having a harder time staying in business, then highly skilled professional journalists are finding themselves out of a job. Mr. Lanier predicts that this damage won't stop with the music and journalism industries. And as more and more industries become more and more based in digital information, as they inevitably will, those industries will be just as damaged by this notion that intellectual property is supposed to be free. Because if you spend your time and effort making something, but the only ones getting paid for your time and effort are a few giant tech companies, I think that's gonna disincentivize your creativity. Obviously that's complicated and there are more incentives for creativity than just making money and this room of people understands that probably better than anyone. Um, but still, I think if we're gonna figure out how to kind of move forward in this kind of future of, of making things together, we have to figure out how to get people paid for doing good work. Um, so that's, that's free culture, right? Third, uh, third thing I want to talk about, third pillar of the internet, today's internet, uh, is what I would call socializing. Um, and again, just like the other two, there, there are huge upsides to what goes on via social networks or social media. I always feel a little like cringy just saying the word social media, but um, there's, there are real upsides to it, right? People are able to connect with each other from all over the world and, and share their lives and their perspectives with one another, and, and it can be really beautiful. Um, and of course, the prime examples of this are like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, other things like them. Um, but as legitimate as the upsides are, I also think that this kind of socializing online, it's limited in its ability to facilitate substantial creativity. Because these platforms aren't built for that. GitHub is built for that. Facebook is not. You know, they're, they're, they're built for socializing. They're not conducive to elaborate or complex or nuanced processes or interactions. Like when you check your feed on Instagram, for example, you're just scrolling. You're scrolling from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. You're never focusing on anything for very long. And by the way, that's how these companies make money, right? The more items you scroll through, the more ads you see, the more money they make. So it's in their interest to keep your attention span short. Facebook's landing page invites you to connect with your friends and the world around you. And again, I think people connecting with each other, that's a great thing, it really is. My question is, are there ways to take it a step further, past just connecting with each other and towards creating together? And of course, I think so, and I think you guys know so, if you're participating in you know, the, create, the open source creation of, of software together. You're doing stuff online that's more than just socializing, you're making stuff together. And that to me is, is really exciting. So, now we've talked about these three sort of pillars of the internet, the crowd, free culture, socializing. Um, and again, uh, there's, there's more than these three, but these three are just three prominent things. And I wanna reemphasize, I really do think that all three of these things are positive in their own right. But given their limitations that we just talked about when it comes to collaborative creativity, I want to propose uh, three alternative pillars. Um, and they are, oh, but, uh, and I should say, I'm not just making these up, right? These are, these are sort of three principles that we've arrived at organically over the years uh, in building and running HitRecord. 
Okay, so first, um, instead of thinking about the crowd, what if we think about community? Second, instead of thinking about free culture, uh, what if we think about fair compensation? And third, instead of socializing, what if we think about collaborating? All right. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about each of these principles, and, uh, and then I'm just going to show you a bit about how we apply them on Hit Record. So first, community, as opposed to the crowd. All right, so to me, th the biggest difference between a community and a crowd is every member of a community is a unique individual. So the strength of that community, someone went, oh, appreciate that. <laughs> the strength of a community is less about the quantity of the people and more about uh, the quality of their contributions and their interactions. Now on Hit Record, community is, is the most important thing to us. Um, in fact, sometimes we get called a, a, a crowdsourced production company, and I'm always like, mm, I prefer to call it a community-sourced production company. And I know that's sort of a ticky-tack difference, but to me, I just, I just feel kind of rude calling our community a crowd. It feels like, you know, I'd be failing to acknowledge all the unique individuals and their unique contributions that make our company what it is. So... We can go back to the two kinds of crowdsourcing um, that I was talking about earlier, and we could see the hit record doesn't really fit into either one of these. There's the big data-driven kind of crowdsourcing, um, but at least for now, there aren't any number-crunching algorithms deep enough to match human creative expression. You know, counting the number of likes can't replace a talented curator with good taste. So again, for now, and I say for now because I know there's, you know, probably a lot of AI fans in this crowd, they're like, it's going to happen. There will be robot novelists. Um, and there probably will be. Um, but for now, they're not here yet. And uh, you know, a big data-driven algorithm can't do what our community does. Um, other type of crowdsourcing that we talked about was uh, what we call the open contest. And um, on Hit Record, we say it all the time, this is not a contest. It's a collaboration. And we really try to emphasize that we're all working together towards a common goal. Um, one of the most important ways we do this is with a methodology we call Remix. This would be something very familiar to coders. This is exactly what you guys do when you use, okay, I'm going to take someone else's, I'm not technical enough, I'm not a coder, someone else's library, someone else's function, someone else's class. I don't know, is that like old? Anyway, what do you, what do you call it now? Uh, um, and you use it to make something of your own, right? That's what we call a remix. So like on our site, one way that that would happen is someone like uploads a simple drawing and then someone takes that drawing and turns it into an animation. Um, that we would call a remix. The drawing's gonna come up and then that drawing's gonna turn, or did it already happen? There's the drawing. This is something that happened on our site and this kind of thing happens all the time, right? Um, someone will take that drawing and then turn it into an animation. That's, the, that's, that's how we make things together. Um, so, like, someone's personal story, for example, that could get remixed into a script. And then other artists, like actors or illustrators or animators and musicians, they might build off that script to produce, uh, to produce a finished short film, and then that short film might become part of a television show, etc. That's, that's how we make things. And this is how a bunch of smaller contributions from different people can all add up to finished products. Again. I know I keep saying this. You guys inherently understand this. Most crowds that I talk to are like, wait, what? How, what? how could a whole, people from, a whole bunch of people from all over the world actually work together to make something? Um, you guys understand that. Uh, so this process of people remixing each other, it's quite different from a contest. Right? In our community, if someone, if someone over here has a good idea, well, then this person over here can build on top of that idea. And, you know, maybe they can build on top of that idea in ways that the first person never anticipated. And everyone's working together. So when we finish something on hit record, like a short film or a song or whatever, you know, it's not just a winning entry from a lone competitor. All of our finished work, um, it's been touched by lots of contributors and they're all remixing each other. They're all on the same team. They're all part of one community. And, and that facilitates the kind of creativity that I've been talking about that would have been possible before the internet. Okay, so that's community. 
Uh, the next alternative pillar I'm gonna call fair compensation, right? And this is uh, in contrast to free culture. And again, I know that this is something you guys think a lot about um, when you're determining which license is gonna go with what project uh, in, you know, uh, in, in the open source uh, context. Um, so I said it before, I think it bears repeating, and I know this is probably somewhat controversial in this room, um, but I personally believe that if someone does some work and that work somehow generates some money, then that person deserves some of that money. Um, now on Hit Record, anytime one of our productions makes money, everyone whose contribution is included in the final version gets some of that money. Um, now, figuring out what's fair and which artists get how much money, that's no small feat, um, but we have an open and collaborative process for that too. Uh, and we've been doing it this way for six years now. Um, we still haven't been sued, and we've paid more than $2 million to contributors in our community from all around the world. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, there's a great quote that's actually attributed to Walt Disney that, uh, that I like to say when, when we talk about money on Hit Record, and I bet um, this would resonate with you guys too. Uh, and it's that we don't make movies to make money, we make money to make more movies. Which to me just says like, just because you're not motivated by the money, you know, you're, you might be motivated because you love what you're doing, but I still think there's a place that money has to kind of fit into it just to sustain the thing. Because um, people are happy to get paid in our community, but I honestly think that for most of them it's not about the money. It's the principle, it's that they feel that their time and their effort have been fairly acknowledged and compensated. I think that's a big part of what allows our community to be so productive together. So, that's fair compensation. Um, all right, lastly, um, as opposed to socializing, I wanna talk about collaborating. And what I mean by this is um, people connecting online not just to socialize through bite-sized interactions, but to work together towards a common goal, to be productive, to be creative. Again, this is something you guys know a lot about. Um, in fact, I would like to learn from you guys about how you do it. Because um, on Hit Record, this is what we're all about, is, is collaboration, is people making things together. On our landing page, we say we're a new kind of online community working together as a production company. So one of the biggest ways we achieve this is through our user experience of our web app and, and our mobile app. So when you come to hit record, you'll find some things in common with most social media platforms. Like you can post content or you can heart things that you like or you can subscribe to other users, but you'll also find a lot of differences. Maybe these differences have more overlap with like a GitHub than they do with an Instagram. Um, so anyone can issue what we call a creative challenge uh, for example, maybe it's a writing challenge or a photography challenge, et cetera, and then writers or photographers, they can find those challenges and contribute to them. And then you can organize a series of challenges into what we call a project. So you can set deadlines in your project or you can send out updates, and then as you get contributions uh, to the creative challenges that you're happy with, you can cross out those challenges that are done. Um, and then we in the creative department uh, at the Hit Record office, we maintain what we call our project development slate. So this is a front-facing list. Um, it's a list of outstanding projects that we've decided to focus on as a production company. Um, and we categorize these projects into um, three columns. You can see there's sort of an early stage of development we call concept development. Um, then we move it into what we call advanced development. And then if and when we're able to secure distribution or some other kind of monetization for the project, then we put it into the funded column. Now, of course, um, the technology alone won't necessarily get people to collaborate. Um, equally important, we've found, is how we as a company use the technology. Um, because this whole model, it doesn't work without leadership. So um, the director of Hit Record is me. Um, I think you guys call it um, BDFL, if I'm not mistaken. I just learned that. Um, and it's funny, because I actually, when, when I heard that what BDFL stood for, I was like, oh, that's actually something I say on Hit Record. I'm like, this is not a democracy. It's a benevolent dictatorship. Um, and, that, and that's important, because um, there has to be someone who has the final say 
when you're you know, working on something together. And I'm, I'm the one with the final say on how our productions turn out. But I don't make these decisions alone, far from it. Um, there's, of course, our intrepid staff. Um, that's our staff on, on Halloween. <laughs> uh, and, um, and then we also tap quite a few individual members of the community who've proven themselves in talent and dedication. Um, so there's people out there who you know, don't work for us but are just you know, great members of our community. And they really help a lot too. And, and um, between all of us, we provide enough direction uh, to make sure that the entire community is working together as a cohesive whole. Now, do people in our community make friends? Yes. And, and do they care about each other? Yes, quite a lot. But they don't care about each other just because you know, they've seen photos of each other's respective lunch orders from that day. They care about each other because they're engaged in, in an intimate and creative process together. And then the fact that they're also friends, it only just helps them collaborate all the better. Um, so that's collaborating. Uh, now, having told you about all that, uh, I actually think the best way for you to really kind of understand it is, is just for me to give you an example. Um, so I'm going to briefly take you through one of the short films uh, that we made for our television show and talk a bit about how we made it. Um, and then I'm going to play it for you. So uh, this is a short film called First Stars I See Tonight. Um, it started with a challenge to tell a story about your first time. Uh, you know, could be your first time doing anything. That's what a challenge looks like on the site. Um, and uh, so this one contributor told this extraordinary story about her real life, about how she was 16 years old the first time she ever saw the stars. Right? Um, I thought that was really cool. I took her piece of writing and I remixed it. Made it about half the length. Uh, and then I issued another challenge um, for voiceover artists to read her story out loud. Um, that's what the voiceover challenge looked like. Um, next, we shot actors in front of a green screen acting out the story. And we posted that green screen footage on the site. Um, so it's not finished at all. Um, we just posted the green screen footage on the site. And then we issued new challenges to illustrators and animators to fill in the graphical world around the actors. Those are those challenges. Last thing we did uh, was issue another challenge to composers to write the score. Uh, and even after that, new challenges um, for musicians to play the score that had been composed. So when it was all finished, um, we had put together 66 different pieces of content out of 1,443 that were contributed. Um, and it all added up to this beautiful short film that, uh, that I want to play for you right now. So um, for the moment, just pretend we're not at a tech conference and that we're like at a film festival. And um, this isn't too long, um, but it's something I'm proud of. I, I, I hope you enjoy it. It's called First Stars I See Tonight. When I was 16, I saw the Milky Way for the first time. I was six months old when I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. I'm lucky. The type that I have is not the most vicious or devastating. It means that I'm night blind, that my peripheral vision is slowly narrowing into a pinhole, and that my depth perception is gradually flattening away to nothing. My cousins and I used to go out and lie on sleeping bags in the back of a pickup truck and watch meteor showers. They would watch, I would stare up into the black sky and study the seven bright points of light that I could see and wonder what it was like. Then my dad. My father ordered a pair of Russian night vision goggles from a military surplus catalogue. He said he wanted to watch his sprinklers at night and make sure they didn't get plugged by debris in the irrigation water. But he also knew what a gift it would be for me. When the package arrived, I spent the day reading the instructions over and over again, waiting for night to fall. Then finally, the sun went down, Dad turned off our yard light, and we went outside. I put on the goggles and looked up into the sky. 
It was a personal miracle. Stretching above me in uncountable points of light as far as I could see, there were stars. Some of them clustered so tightly together they made swirling patterns of white against the inky darkness. I stared. I'd had people describing the stars to me all my life. And what I'd come to realise was that everyone tells you something different because they all see them in their own way. But none of what they had tried to describe to me could possibly match the glittering arch of that night sky. I still wasn't seeing what others would have. Even with the assistance of night vision goggles, there would be stars too dim for my eyes to perceive. Then too, there was the matter of that green wash of colour over everything. It didn't matter. I was breathless under an arm of the Milky Way that I'd always simply had to take on faith was even there. My dad had done what all good fathers promise their children they'll do. He gave me the stars. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks very much. So, okay, so community, fair compensation, collaboration. Those three principles, they become central to how we make things on Hit Record. Um, and those things that we make on Hit Record, as you can see, is things like that, that no isolated individual could have really made something quite like that. Um, and that's the kind of creativity that I think the internet has the potential to facilitate. And really what's going on in this room today is the, the best proof. Um, but when I say creativity, I don't only mean making art. You guys know about how it can work in, in the generation of software. I wonder if it could, you know, these same principles might, might be applied in, in other areas, uh, in other fields. Um, for example, uh, you know, like perhaps in the field of journalism, right? So there, there's so many people out there who, who blog about the news independently, and sometimes it can feel like people are just shouting in an echo chamber. But what if they could form productive communities that, that collaborated on larger feats of a substantial investigative journalism? Or um, like a lot of experts agree that, that our methods of education really need reinvention. So what if rather than competing against your classmates because the class is being graded on a curve, what if students worked on collaborative projects where they all pulled together as a team? And then what if your team was not bound by the walls of your classroom but you know, also included online community of kids from around the world? I'm sure you guys have thought of this because this is the kind of thing you guys do. Um, <clears throat> couldn't school work that way? Um, then of course there's government, right? Which is an area that we're all probably thinking about a lot these days. And um, I think, obviously, the internet could and should be able to help modernize the people's ability to be truly represented by our democracy. And perhaps a similar process to the one we use to create art, or the one you guys use to create software, could be used to create policy. <clears throat> but if that's going to work, our online culture is really going to have to grow up a bit. I think the one thing that you can say for sure is that as we move forward into the future, the internet will definitely impact every industry more and more. And the question is, what kind of impact will that be? But if people all around the world can come together, do more than just connect and socialize, but if we can actually collaborate to create things that, that we wouldn't have been able to make without each other, when I picture that future, I start to feel optimistic about the future. Because it's, it's not just the capabilities of technology, it's, it's what the technology can make us capable of as human beings. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you. Really good, thank you, thank you. really good. You know, you know, we've been talking about you know, this kind of intersection of culture and code. And I think one of the things that these folks know is that the code that they've created that runs most of society these days has a lot of power and responsibility with it. Mm -hmm. you know, we talked about keeping in touch and you know, if you can help us understand how culture, how the kind of 
you know, emotion invoking works that you're creating can be assisted by the code and the power of this room, yeah. we would be super happy. I would love to do that. And I'd really, I'd love to not only, um, I, I would love to provide whatever insights that, that we can from what we do, and I'd also really, I, I'm sure that there's a lot that we can learn um, uh, from how you guys do what you do that could be applicable uh, for our process as well. Deal. Cheers, man. All Thank right. you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>